if there's one thing I say uh, that sticks with you, I, I hope it's this one. Don't think of this as an energy problem. Liquid fuels, it's liquid fuels. It's a liquid fuel problem. We can't take photovoltaics and run the cars that are out on the streets now. Maybe in the future, photovoltaics will work into an electric power system that runs electric vehicles. But for the near term, we have something like 50 to 100 trillion dollars, that's big money, of investment in vehicles and airplanes, ships, uh, all kinds of equipment that can only operate on liquid fuels. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. The most important event that is coming, that uh, at least the way I look at things, is the onset of decline. That, to me, means that the kind of plateau that we're on now, plus or minus future fluctuations, uh, is going to break and go into decline. And that's, of course, when the world is in the most severe trouble. Lastly, it, uh, many people would like to have the date of when decline will occur, and um, that's a natural thing. It's a natural human thing, it seems to me. Uh, many people feel that uh, the decline is going to uh, begin in something like two to five years, and with the world being as complicated as it is in so many ways, uh, I, th I don't think one can do much better than that. But it really doesn't make any difference, because from the work that we've done and others have done, it's going to take us something like 20 years to catch up with this problem, uh, rather you know, 20 years to catch up with this problem. And so uh, we really should have started quite some time ago. Uh, the time scales and how you phase things, uh, the longer you wait, of course, the worse it's gonna be. The other point is that I think it's very important for everybody in this audience, no matter what your situation is, to think about what this problem is going to mean to you personally. Uh, if you're at my age and, um, uh, and, and reasonably uh, uh, well through your uh, professional career and your finances are reasonable, that's good, but better take a hard look at those finances because where you have your money is very important in a situation where we're going into oil production decline. That's going to hurt just a whole lot of the nor normal standard things, or at least normal as of a couple of weeks ago, normal standard things where people would put their money. So everybody needs to do that. And also think about your jobs. If you're a younger person, things you might get into and, uh, and things that you may be into uh, right now. If you're involved in business, you need to think very carefully about alternate scenarios in terms of what these things might mean to you. And of course, the thing that we haven't been able to uh, really move yet is major national and, interla and international uh, 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 changes and, uh, and rethinking. There was talk about global warming, and there were some people that quite understandably think that we ought to be treating global warming and peak oil in the same way. Uh, I find that difficult, personally, because while there is no question that in my mind at least, that there is warming in the world and that has all of the people concerned. There are people who believe that it's because of us and that may or may not be correct. But the thing that is obvious to me is that when people are hurting badly, when they're losing their jobs, when they're losing their cars, when they're destitute, when they're not sure what it is they're going to do to survive, and that's the kind of thing we're talking about when peak oil hits. When those things hit, people are going to be pushing for one thing, and that is fix now. Fix now. So think about that. Think about how people will react. Think about how you might react if you're caught on the wrong end of uh, this kind of situation. And I would encourage any of you that haven't done so to begin to do some back of the envelope. It may take a couple of envelopes to do it. Uh, but take a look at the rates of change that we're talking about. That 1% equal 860,000 barrels a day, and we're talking about 3 to 5% decline rates uh, and how long it takes to bring in new vehicles 
in, in a recessionary period and so forth, and how long it takes to build uh, coal to liquids plants or those shale plants or a number of the other things that we're talking about. Spend some time looking at rates of change. The more you look at it, the more you see that this problem initially is going to run away from our best efforts. The barriers to convincing people about the character of the problem. Uh, there's a number of uh, barriers that were listed. I, I think that the, uh, the list could be uh, longer. One of them is that there's a lot of other pressing problems. Uh, when people are talking about Medicare, they're talking about Social Security, they're talking about a whole variety of different things. And to talk about peak oil, uh, particularly when you're trying to worry about this three and a half and four dollar a gallon of uh, gasoline, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, this has happened before. There were people in the past and there were good efforts that were put forward to try to manage peak oil because it was thought to happen before. So the boy cried wolf. And once the boy cried wolf, the uh, wolf's got to eat the boy before people will pay attention. There's denial, and that gets back again to this willful human blindness. There's faith in technology, and I've been in technology my, uh, my whole career, and there's no question in my mind that technology can do a lot and will do a lot in the future, but it is not a quick fix. It is simply something that is going to help us to get to where we need to go, but we're going to have to deal with things that we have right now. Faith in government. Some people might laugh at that a little bit, but in our hearts of hearts, I think we all want our governments to work efficiently. And eventually, in a lot of cases, they end up uh, doing that. Anyway, those are the kind of things that uh, stand in the way of getting the message out. If there's one thing I say uh, that sticks with you, I, I hope it's this one. Don't think of this as an energy problem. Liquid fuels. It's liquid fuels. It's a liquid fuel problem. We can't take photovoltaics and run the cars that are out on the streets now. Maybe in the future, photovoltaics will work into an electric power system that runs electric vehicles. But for the near term, we have something like 50 to 100 trillion dollars, that's big money, of investment in vehicles and airplanes, ships, uh, all kinds of equipment that can only operate on liquid fuels. We have got to keep those fleets going or we shut down our economy and we'll have total anarchy. So the problem, working the problem, mitigating this problem, have, means that of course we're gonna have to conserve as best we can and as fast as we can, but that doesn't happen overnight. And we have to have substitute liquid fuels or we are all in terrible, terrible trouble. Point was made that rebuilding our energy system will be the biggest construction effort in history. I suspect that that's right. It's going to be absolutely enormous. Um, it's almost beyond imagination. Um, there's going to be a lot of pain associated with the problems we're dealing with, but don't forget the word opportunities. There are going to be opportunities to contribute, and there are going to be people and organizations that win and prosper through the misery that we're talking about. A phrase, a great phrase from some time ago is that the best is the enemy of the good. And I think about that a lot. I think when circumstances are really severe and we're headed towards that, good is the enemy of the adequate. We need to think about, again, the compromises we made. One person uh, passed me a little note after hearing some of the less positive things that were presented, saying the U.S. is finished. Uh, it's not finished. We're not finished. I, uh, as, uh, what, what I try to do is to face these issues uh, directly, but I've never lost my optimism. We are not going to roll over and die. We are not going to get tread into the ground. We are not going to be like the Roman Empire. We are going to reorganize ourselves. We're going to go through a whole lot of pain, and we're going to come out of this on top because we're Americans, and that's what we do. Thank you. I didn't get my question asked uh, when you had your panel, and so I was hoping um, on a lighter note, maybe you would share with the audience what Evelyn's solution is to this energy crisis. Okay, Evelyn's my daughter. She's now nine. Uh, a year ago, when she was eight, she actually gives me a lot of good energy advice. She made a comment as we're driving to one of her soccer games, which is 30 miles away, it seems like. 
And she said, and we talked about energy a lot. She's very attuned to these issues. I think as most kids are, most kids are actually more savvy than a lot of the adults. She says, Daddy, if we keep all driving our cars, we'll run out of gas. And that'll be great, because then we'll have to ride bicycles everywhere, right? <laughs> and I thought this was sort of a very positive view of what could happen. And Randy, you'd all mentioned earlier that maybe this is a blessing. And it made me realize that for some people, this is a good thing. Uh, from her view, being trapped in a car doesn't sound like much fun. And so we think about peak oil, that means peak traffic and peak congestion and peak rush hours and things like that, right? So there might be some good outcomes from this. Then we think of all these social ills where we complain about divided neighborhoods and people don't talk to each other anymore and obesity is the number one public health problem behind asthma. And so if we think we'll have to walk and ride bikes, maybe we'll be healthier and a lot of these problems will be fixed will be closer to our neighbors. So she's got a very positive view and I think that's sort of, sort of interesting thing to think about. We tend to approach this as a doom and gloom outcome is the only possible manifestation of peak oil, but there might be some very good things as well. How can we urge intelligent planned action prior to the doo-doo actually hitting the fan? <laughs> I, uh, some of you may have sat in on the session I did on the first day, and um, you have to, if you want intelligent action, then you have to present this problem in language that legislators understand. Uh, I use the example, if you want to walk in and tell them the Mayan calendar says the world ends in 2012, they're going to say, well, thank you for that. And, you know, is there anything else on your mind? And please leave. If you, if you want intelligent responses from legislators, you need to speak their language. And you need to talk to them about something that they're all mostly keenly aware. And I would say, number one, give up on Washington. Start working on your states. Start working on your communities. Start working on the people who you bump in, into in restaurants and in stores, not the people you see once or twice a year. So um, what's important to me? I've been uh, in almost every position in the legislature in 18 years, and uh, for a long time I was the uh, vice chairman of appropriations. I handled about $18 billion. And what I understood about my obligation was how money was spent and the impacts of how money was spent. So if you come in and, and, and you want to talk to about how I sold peak oil in my own legislature was to talk about economic impact and how it relates to the duties of a legislator to the people that they represent, to the future of those people. I expressed some concern about GD, state GDP falling, unemployment, tax, tax revenue failure, uh, the impact on housing. Uh, state is, all states, pretty much in the United States anyways, house a lot of people, we call them prisons and they have to be heated and they have to be fed to look at which road will we not maintain as tax revenues drop because of demand destruction on oil. So I tried to lay out the impact, the economic impact, and the obligation to the state to serve its population and the explosive growth in social services that would follow a contraction in our service economy, which would be at first. So I got their attention with that by saying whether you, whether you uh, understand peak oil or you do not understand peak oil, what you understand is an escalating trend in the increased cost. You get supply disruptions because you've witnessed hurricanes and so forth. I think we got 40 rigs in the Gulf missing still after the last hurricane, uh, the older one. So I, I think they, that's how you approach it. If you want them to respond and you want them to delve into your issue, you need to approach them with, I have concerns about you accomplishing your commitment to this community, which is to, to, to protect it. And most of them see that as an economic response. And if they feel the economy of the state is at, in, is, is at threat, I think they respond by saying, tell me more. And once you get tell me more, you have, you've opened the door. And so, I mean, the, the yeah, I'm sorry, I think it's already hit the fan, but uh, uh, you know, my obligation is uh, uh, to keep going uh, as long as possible to soften the impact on the people I represent. You know, I, I like those people. Steve has a question for himself. <laughs> Actually, it's not a question for myself. It seems that I would be the appropriate person to answer this. Uh, and there are two of them on the same thing, so I thought, hey, I'd uh, take a crack at it. Has anyone asked Al Gore if he'd be willing to carry the peak oil message? He seems to have some clout. Um, and then someone else said uh, Terry Backer spoke in the, uh, in the state and local government sessions about finding a champion. As an ASPO newcomer, I feel ASPO needs very public figures on the national and international level. Agreed. 
Does ASPO have any outreach to recruit those people? Uh, peak oil needs in Al Gore. It's interesting that Al Gore was was the, the person chosen, and, and I think for obvious reasons. Uh, just to give you a little quickie here, there um, in July of uh, 2006, President Clinton was quoted on a uh, uh, extensive, uh, uh, I think it was Atlantic radio interview about peak oil, and then has since spoken about it some, but that's one that was on the record. Um, the month prior to that, I was at a uh, retreat with a couple of dozen people, and Al Gore was one of those individuals. And um, I gave a 15-minute wrap on peak oil uh, one of those evenings. In fact, if Richard Heinberg is here, the reason I was at that meeting was because it was in my backyard, and he referred uh, them to me. I appreciated that opportunity. Um, that's the kind of synergy and, and work together we need to do more of, by the way. Um, at any rate, uh, I made a small presentation. Uh, I have a, a two-page data set on, that tells the peak oil story. Uh, we publish it in the, uh, every June. Uh, it's based on the BP data. And I handed that out. Uh, uh, I had literally one copy. This is impromptu. And he came up afterwards and said, nice data set, as a geek, true geek, would, would do it. Um, <laughs> Then, uh, but he was on Larry King Live the following week. I mean, this was the week that Inconvenient Truth, two or three weeks after Inconvenient Truth had hit the theaters and the bookstores. And uh, 40, 58 minutes of that session uh, on, on Larry King Live was on the, the climate change story. But he was pitched the question at the end, so anything else on your mind? And he mentioned peak oil. And he, not only did he mention, but he talked about a number of serious geologists who take this position, uh, who've been at it a long time. So I thought I would at least share that, that there are some folks who are, have been at the top uh, have, have mentioned this. But the, going to the point uh, uh, of these questions here, who, uh, if you marry the peak oil and climate change questions that closely together, and Maury Wolfson on our board has, has pointed this out, there's a tendency, if for those who reject the climate change story, and there's a percentage who do, uh, it isn't a huge number. I think Terry's nodding because this is, this is something we talked about uh, when he was writing his report. Um, if you marry those two uh, very closely, you may find that those who ha have a resistance to the one story automatically build in a resistance to the other story. It doesn't mean that they don't uh, work together at some level. It means that you need to be careful how you frame the story. To that end, we do need, though, and, and this is a really good point, we do need some high-profile figures who would be willing to step in front of the mic, a la who killed the electric car. Uh, we need something that gets that kind of circulation uh, to, to break on through. Um, and so I would encourage the collective wisdom of the room to not just write us questions on this, but write some suggestions as to who we could get and how we could approach them. You know, we tried to approach Matt Damon. Uh, didn't work, but maybe we ought to go back to it. Those Syriana clips and the goodwill hunting are as good as it gets, at least in, in modern times. So just sowing that seed with you, taking your own question and giving it back to you. Thanks for the question. Would you like to care to comment a little bit about how we could maybe frame this so that it's more palatable? I, I, I hate to have a race between the climate change and the peak oil group. Uh, because it's not the type of race that we should be running. I think that it needs to be reframed into a, an issue of energy security uh, because it all comes down to the security of your supply, whether you make an issue of the supply impacting the environment or the supply impacting your lifestyle in a carbon-constrained world. But we need to reframe this in an issue to, to, to identify the uh, issue of energy security and all the ramifications that means. And of course, the mitigation options uh, will serve both camps. Uh, but in order to get the message across, it's one of energy security. And, and, and the other issue I wanted to make about the point earlier, uh, asking a, a figurehead to lead the charge, whether it's a politician or a celebrity, uh, whenever you have a point taken and there's data that someone else can refute the message, 
you're, it's very unlikely that certainly not a politician will come up and, and refute the data of our own government uh, in the USGS in terms of reserves or the projections in the EIA. So until and unless we can change the data set, and I, and I think that can be done politically, but until and unless we can change the data set and take away that weapon of the opposition to point to this government data and, and refute what you're saying in terms of peak oil or whatever, uh, that's the mission. You know, I, I won't turn into a free-for-all, but I think it's important because I labored over that. Uh, when I drafted a bill, I had to come up with a name for it. And I labored over it and I said, you know, uh, Armageddon, death of destruction. What I came up with was an act concerning energy scarcity and security. And people don't like scarcity and they do like security and it put a different tone to the debate on the floor. And I think how you frame it is very, very important. And we want people to understand how important this is. But you know, if they say, hey, you've got 20 minutes to live, you know, someone pour me a drink. <laughs> well, you know, an interesting thing, I was talking to someone who um, knows I'm a peakster. And uh, he said, the problem with peak oil is that it implies we need to find more. And I thought it was a really interesting observation. When I hear criticism from people about the way I'm framing something, I take it very seriously and try to, and, you know, try to think of it from their perspective because uh, you know, we have to go to people where they are, not where we are. Uh, Michael, what are your suggestions for individual and household energy reduction strategies? I tend to focus for individuals and small businesses on water use. You can save energy faster by saving water than most other approaches, and you can start with solar or hot water. That's actually much more cost effective. It's much better way to reduce carbon, much better way to reduce energy, to use solar hot water than solar panels by far per dollar per square foot per photon. So that's a great way to start. Going towards water efficient devices, dishwashers and laundry as well, doing less laundry and fewer dishes. Water is a big part of our energy consumption overall on the residential side. The other side is food preservation through refrigeration and freezing as a next step. We all have a refrigerator, and then we all have a freezer. It seems like where do we put that freezer? In the hot garage, where it works hotter. And so we have a lot of these programs to encourage you with rebates to get a more energy efficient refrigerator. So we do, and then we put the non-energy efficient refrigerator in the hot garage, where it's working twice as hard. So there, there are a lot of simple things we can do just on food and water that save a lot of energy. And then you can work on thermostats and light bulbs, things like that later. Uh, one thing we do in Texas that's bad is we tend to have big houses that we air condition and then we have the lights on during the day so the air conditioner has to fight the light bulbs. In the Northeast, the light bulbs are actually useful because they heat the house for you in the winter, so they're different things. But I would focus on water first, food second. Kyle Saunders may look like a professor of political science from Colorado, but he has a hidden identity. This man is Professor Goose from the Oil Drum. Okay, Kyle, what's the Oil Drum? Oh, Janaya, it is, um, the Oil Drum is a site at theoildrum.com uh, that basically facilitates discussions about research, about energy and our future. And we allow and facilitate discussions about complex interde interdependent interdisciplinary topics that range from everything from Hubbard's Peak to when that's going to be to oil production to gas prices this week to the social concerns that are caused by these resource depletion problems to name it. Literally, oh. it's uh, name, name something energy related, which is just about everything, and we talk about it. Well, I'm going to have you go back to square one, because let's talk about people who may not have the faintest idea about why are we concerned about energy? Why would you even have a site? And is this just for academia? No, it's not. It, it, it is. Well, that's, that's part, one part of the problem, I think, is because energy as a topic is such a complex, interdependent subject that we need to facilitate as many conversations as we can in order to have a discussion and learn from each other. You know, when you just think about from an academic point of view, economists talking to geologists. Think about economists talking to psychologists. Think about all those sorts of things. Then imagine bringing in normal people. Educated people, educated people are gonna have to, you have to be educated to understand this message. But imagine subjecting them and allowing them to hear the various arguments, the various viewpoints from each side. That's what we do. And 
on the site, we'll, we'll have posts, we'll have news summaries, we'll have different aspects of the energy message where people can sit down, read those things, and react and talk to people about these pressing topics. These Why topics are they pressing topics? Why, Why pressing now? Topics? I'm taking you back to square one. This is, you know, 101 energy. Because we face through many different aspects of energy, whether it's resource depletion, whether we hear, we're, you know, we're here talking about peak oil, we could just as easily be talking about peak water. We could just as easily be talking about many other ecological and resource constraints that our world faces. And so when you start talking about peak oil as a liquid fuels problem, and you start talking about are we going to have enough, you know, pr the price signal of gasoline or oil, or, you know, especially today after we've seen a $25 run up in oil, uh, why did that occur? Uh, well, that occurred partially because of the, the economic situation. That occurred partially because, the, and that in turn was a caused by a dollar drop. The dollar drop causes the right, and this is exactly the kind of integration that I'm talking about we have to do. And that, so to start from, to actually answer your question, we get to the point of you have to have all the empirical facts that you can get in front of you and then have community around you talking to each other, even if it's on the web, even, and learn from each other. That's the whole idea. That's the reason we do what we do. Which really says in a much more uncertain future, people are going to be needing to think about life cannot continue business as usual as we've been used to. As, as economic growth declines, which it looks like it will, uh, it's, uh, it is, and, and, and who knows how long, um, Politics is facilitated, dem democracy is facilitated by, at the end of the day, cheap energy and economic growth. Integrating all of these different things, and it, it, it leads you to a pretty pessimistic point. I mean, you start saying, because you really want to, I mean, it's like in my classes, I, you really want to tell students, I mean, I teach a policy class, you really want to tell students, it's going to be great. You're, you're, going, to, you're, you're going to have an awesome future. Uh, things are going to go really smoothly for you. It's hard to tell them that they might have to deal with less and that they might have to do things with less and they might still accomplish more. Thank you, Professor Goose, <laughs> for educating everybody. I mean, for your work, sort of, it feels to me sort of like relentless, ongoing, we must wake up educating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for what you do. <laughs> <laughs>